Kareem Ray, your host at the One Soccer Nation podcast, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Tony Sane. Tony is a retired American professional soccer player who has played in the MLS. He made his debut for the United States national team on January 29th, 1997, and notably represented the U.S. national team in the 2002 World Cup, currently serving as the founder and CEO of the Sane Foundation. Uh, Tony, I know I just mentioned like a few things here. You've accomplished uh, so much in your career. Um, and you're currently doing so much now. One of my favorite questions to ask my guest is if you remember your first memory. So if you could just like take us back in time and just share your first memory with us. A beautiful game. A beautiful game. <clears throat> you know, my first memory of the, of the beautiful game is probably, you know, I went to visit my my um, my dad's family in West Africa and the Gambia. <clears throat> and I started to, you know, go in the street and play. And, you know, my first memory is kind of like learning to juggle, you know, these small rubber balls that they had, you know, on the street and really using the game to help me make friends there. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, your journey from playing college soccer to the highest levels of international competition is remarkable. Can you share, a, you know, a standout moment or memory from your playing career that has left a lasting impact on you? Um, you know, I think... You know, when I was when I was in college, I just think there was a point um, <clears throat> really when I realized like I saw the game differently. And it was actually probably my senior year in high school. Um, and I just thought that um, something is going on that, you know, um, you know, the way I'm able to process physically my attributes, it's it's I'm a little bit different. And I never went and said I'm going to be a pro player. But as my mom will tell you, like all my actions. Um, you know, went towards that. So, um, you know, I think something just clicked along the way and, you know, it clicked a couple of different times in my career as well when to, <clears throat> to allow me to take my game to the next level. But, um, you know, I think there was one game in high school where I just, where I just felt like um, different. And then, um, you know, you, you go to college thinking it's this whole new world and all of a sudden you're, you're still faster, you're still bigger you're still as skillful and and you you have a different kind of will than other people and a different kind of drive um and so that's what that's what you know what i remember sort of from high school and soccer and then um you know doing what it takes when i talk to young people now and i say are you willing to you know make fifteen thousand dollars for the next five years to invest in becoming a pro player <clears throat> The question a lot of times is, well, you know, I mean, I can't really do that. And I kind of said, well, you should probably think about something else then, because there's a million people in the world right now that that are willing to do that and put everything they do into this game. Um, and they're probably going to make it on, on sheer will, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned that going pro wasn't always the goal, but all your actions that you took were aligned with that. And that's what made it possible for you to go pro. And the time that you became a professional soccer player is, is a while back. Um, when did you sign your, what year did you sign your first professional contract? And how is the landscape uh, different to where it was before to where it is, where soccer is now in America? Well, let's just say like going pro was always the goal. Let's just say I was too scared to say publicly. Um, have everyone ridicule me saying, well, that's really not possible. You need a backup plan. So I think in my heart, that was always the goal. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think my senior year of college, I went um, uh, in the summer to to travel in France and, you know, a, a pro team there, uh, Lons asked me to stay, but I promised my mom I would, I would come back. And so I, that's one of the ones I regret <clears throat> signing with the first division team, you know, at that age. Um, after the season, I ended up going to Belgium and sort of signed a, a contract with their second team and ended up with a bad ankle injury and then came back to school. And then my first U.S. ISL contract was with the Milwaukee Rampage, where, you know, my first year out of college, I teamed up with Brian McBride, um, which, you know, we were both forward. So we were both forwards together. So, you know, people look at the cross against Portugal in the World Cup. Um, we had done that a hundred times before as we were, you know, two target men um, together in, in our first professional pro professional job. And, um, you know, I 
in the off season, I would play indoor soccer in the NPSL. So I think, you know, you mature really quick because you play with a lot of veterans that have it as a lifestyle and you learn to grind and know what hard work means and you start to appreciate things. And then, you know, Major League Soccer started in, in 96 and um, I kind of held out um, just because I didn't think I could move my family and on on 24,000, which what the, is what they said they were paying all people that came from the U.S. ISL at the time. And uh, luckily for me, D.C. United started off poorly and Bruce Arena kept fighting for me till he got to a number where we agreed to to trust each other and if it worked out you know there would be brighter things ahead and um the rest is history and i went to dc united wow so is that how you know fred mathis yeah so yeah i know fred and you know that's a special time because that dc office whether it was michael cameron the press officer u.s soccer you know fred there's a bunch of people that sort of was the start of this new generation of, of pro soccer that really flourished. And I think Kevin Payne, you know, ran that office. And so you saw people develop in every single aspect, whether it was in sports marketing, whether it was in communications, equipment managers, press officers, players, coaches. Uh, a lot of people came from that organization to continue to work in, in pro soccer today. Yeah, you mentioned DC United, and I just thought, you know, straight to Fred Mathis. He's currently our advisory on our advisory board for One Soccer Nation, and he helped uh, line this uh, podcast up. So shout out to Fred. Um, I think you mentioned it a bit. Uh, your partnership with Brian McBride, notably in the 2002 World Cup match against Portugal, resulted in a memorable goal. Uh, can you just take us behind the scenes of, of that moment a little bit more and, and just share insights into the dy dynamics of that collaboration on the field? Well, you know, we're both two tall target men and I was fast. So, you know, we've been used to playing like a two forward system where I often would get to the wing and, you know, Brian's great because you don't have to pass him the ball. You just have to put it and he'll go get it. Um, and so, you know, in the World Cup, you know, my strength was being a former forward was to get forward. So, you know, I had won the ball, passed it and, you know, I was in good shape. So, you know, I made a long run and, you know, kept going down and, you know, I was really in the corner. So, you know, I knew that he was the only person in the box, but on a large field, um, you know, how was I going to get the ball in the box without the goalkeeper coming out? So, you know, I just remember like really making sure that I, I crossed it more like a shot that I had to get there and kind of get over the first guy and dip. And, you know, Brian just went up and got it and laid out for it. And, um, as he's done so many times in his career, it was a, a beautiful finish. And, you know, we looked at each other and laughed because, you know, we had done that play like a hundred times of me crossing balls and him finishing. Um, but it was on the world stage and it, it'll be memorable for both of us. And, and I think it's memorable for this country, um, you know, going up and, and providing what, what would be, you know, the, one of the, the key goals, um, the game winning goal against, you know, one of the best teams in the world at the time. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, when you when people hear about the World Cup, this is, you know, that's the biggest stage to be on. So once you went pro, was that your next goal to play for the U.S. national, U.S. the U.S. men's national team, or uh, was it something that that just happened? You got scouted and picked up, and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, work my ass off and 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 do the best that I could uh, do to play. Well, you have to understand, like the system in America was really challenging then. You know, I think like I was playing in like an amateur national championship and Bora Motinovic saw me and I got a letter at one point, you know, when I was around, you know, in, in college. So you got noticed, but there wasn't the same scouting. You didn't play against the competition. You didn't get opportunities to really showcase yourself. Um, and so, you know, we were kind of made like the second tier of group, which is like this U.S. national amateur soccer team you know, that they, they brought the regions and, um, you know, I was included in that group. Um, and, you know, it was really a matter of like testing yourself on a regular basis. Um, I think once I started in major league soccer and Bruce Arena kind of helped click it to me and, you know, he made me realize that, you know, I was, I was, you know, world-class or international class and, um, should make that goal and that's what he expected for me on dc and you know you start to play against 
you know, people starting on the national team on a, on a regular basis and you, and you start to beat them and you start to dominate them and you start to feel comfortable in that position. And then, then you start to work on how can you get there, but there's still politics. Um, there's still team dynamics. Um, there's still position, there's still hierarchy. Um, so it was, it was a challenge. And then after my first year in DC, I got invited and, um, you know, probably the most inviting person to me, um, was Eric Winalda. And I think he saw something special in me. Um, I remember at my first camp, he, he laughed at me cause I dribbled past eight people and shot it over the goal. And he reminded me that he gets one chance, you know, every game and he scores it. And if he could dribble through eight people, he would be like, you know, incredible. So he just taught me to like appreciate what I had and, but concentrate on getting better. Um, but it was really inviting to me. And, you know, the first was a, a, a trip in China um, where we, where we played two games, but, you know, once you're in the room, you kind of look around and, and your goal, you know, changes from, you know, staying in the room to owning the room. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any, plans of do you currently own any any professional soccer teams any ownership there or in regard yeah you mentioned ownership so no i don't i don't currently own any any professional teams um you know i would always be interested obviously i i love the game um you know i i believe that you know i my strengths were helping build a culture where people enjoyed themselves uh but winning was always important so um, you know, I'm, I'm open to it, you know, at the right time or the right situation. Uh, you know, you know, quite honestly, when, when I retired, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to get the same opportunities, like in the front office and ownership. Um, you know, you can't argue with a 40 time, right. And you can't argue with your performance on the field, but, um, you know, I, I just thought that people saw me as a big, strong player. Um, and didn't really appreciate the intellect, my passing, the other things that made me great. And I didn't think that I would, you know, survive the, the, that piece of it, right? Because that network, um, you know, in Major League Soccer. So I still wanted to be involved in the game. So and that's why I started the foundation. So I could give back and make decisions what was best for kids um, and have the numbers do the talking for themselves. Absolutely. You mentioned a little bit about the political side as players, you know, as we're younger, we're growing up, we don't know that much. We're just trying to have fun, play the game. And then as it becomes more serious, as you become uh, as players, some players, the one percenters uh, transition into the professional careers, the political side starts to um, there, there's a lot of political. There's a lot of things to do on the field and off the field. So how did you and the time that you played in was was completely different to where, where it is now. Uh, players are more uh, vocal about what's going on versus back in your time where it was kind of like you have to stay quiet and, and do do your job. Um, you know, how, how do you influence the political side now? And, and what, what is your perspective of how things are politically in soccer now versus back in your time when you were playing? Well, you know, I still think, you know, it's hard for, you know, people can speak out, but, um, you're always putting yourself at risk and, you know, people speak out about something and, and, you know, it's highlighted in some places, but not everyone can, can speak out openly. Um, and it's not, this isn't unique to soccer, right? This is power dynamics in the world. Um, I do think it was much easier, you know, to, you know, expel a player back in the day it, when he was sort of where they viewed as troublesome or opinionated or was going against the grain. Um, you know, you hear the Craig Hodges stories in, you know, in the NBA, nobody really hears about that, but, um, you know, a really outspoken person and who, whose career disappeared. And, um, if you look at the people in soccer that, that are elevated, um, or the players, especially the black players that were more outspoken, um, you know, it's not that they were outspoken. It's that they were combative. They were difficult to work with. You know, hard to deal with. Um, you know, I think that there's been some causes here that there's been more of a the younger generation is universally aligned with them. So players have had more support in speaking out, and it's been publicly more accepted and 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 kind of expected. Um, so it's been easier in that in that aspect. So 
you know, I, I'm working on my personal self is, you know, giving opportunities to communities, you know, with less resources to give them the same chances that I had around mentorship um, and opportunities in the game and around the game, which, you know, is the full gamut of the social determinants of health through employment, through opportunities on the field, through jobs, um, so that, you know, people have all the resources um, and the knowledge to make choices to make, you know, what's going to ultimately make them happy, um, not where we decide where they should go. Amazing. After your playing career, you ventured into various roles, including coaching and involvement with not-for-profit organizations. What motivated you to transition from playing to actively contributing to the community, uh, particularly through uh, the initiative like the Sane Foundation? Well, I think, you know, as I, you know, they, some of my, you know, younger players call me Uncle Tony. And I think <clears throat> as I got older in the game, you know, I did want to give back within the game. I just wanted to put myself in a position where I was going to be successful. And you know, I worked too hard and I, I viewed myself as a student of the game. And it was going to be difficult for me to bite my tongue um, and politically, you know, make it through the system um, because I would be compromising my experience and my expertise, you know, and, and as one that played in Europe, that played for a long time, that felt he had a good degree of knowledge of the game, it was going to be really hard for me to sort of be quiet and it was going to be seen, you know, and it's only my perception, but it would be seen as more threatening for someone that, you know, kind of went against the grain. So, um, you know, starting a foundation was a perfect opportunity for me to still give back, use my expertise. Um, I always say there's no place for complacency when helping people. So, you know, use my work ethic to help people um, and still be involved in the game and have those wins. So, um, that's what I did, and the community got got behind me. Um, uh, surprisingly, you know, the soccer community, not as much as the other community, um, has helped me build up, you know, what we have now. And I think the soccer community is starting to realize the impact that I'm having on the game. Um, and as we start to look at really growing the game, it it is about, you know, resources, access, inclusivity, and creating a safe environment for for people of all classes and ethnic communities and genders, sexual orientation to actually play the game. Understood. When you mentioned that this, the soccer soccer community is really taking note, are you mentioning like, um, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I just want to get a clear understanding. When, when you're saying they're starting to take notice, is that like um, organizations like U.S. Soccer Foundation you're starting to get more involvement with certain organizations like the U.S. Soccer Foundation, United Soccer Coaches Convention, like that, more speaking engagements and things like that, or is that, am I off with that question? No, I think it's it's on. You know, we also have a large partnership with MLS where we do, you know, um, you know, uh, well-being and training across all the youth systems. Um, uh, I think more people have come out to look at our model. You know, we're asked to you know, be on the DEI committee for Major League Soccer. Or we, you know, we're asked to speak and be on panels with U.S. Youth Soccer. So, you know, people are seeing us as a solution and, and asking us to actively participate and being at the t table as thought partners in trying to, you know, come up with some options to move the needle forward. Understood. Um, the Sane Foundation focuses on addressing social determinants of health and reducing racial and ethical disparities in Minnesota. Can you elaborate on how sports-based youth development programs play a role in achieving these goals? Well, you know, youth development is youth development, but sports, I think, you know, really cuts down barriers for inclusivity. Um, you know, you can basically tell somebody's health based on the zip code that they live in. So sports-based youth development tied in, you know, with the social determinants of health you know, we're actively making communities healthier. You know, we're empowering youth. We're giving them opportunities. Um, and we're giving them access, um, access to play the game and access to, you know, be in a trauma-free environment, which is really then a catalyst to get support so that we have thriving youth in the community. Amazing. Um, I'm not too sure how to pronounce it properly. Is it L Lorius? USA, uh, USA's elevating. Lorius, yes. Um, 
in regards to that sports initiative, um, how do you see uh, this initiative like EBLS contributing to the empowerment of black leaders in youth sports and what impact do you hope it will have on the community? Well, just internally, I, I learned that, you know, I was going to get much better outcomes in my programming if I had, you know, the caregivers with the same lived experiences as the people that we were working with. Um, and I think Laureus understands that. And, you know, they went out and invested in leaders of color to try to amplify and support and kind of put a little rocket ship behind what they were doing so we could expand further. For me personally, it was good to be in another cohort. I think, you know, I was able to learn from the other organizations in the cohort. I was able to teach, you know, and be a peer mentor to some of the younger people, you know, in the cohort. I also had, you know, financial assistance, technical assistance. So really, you know, they were putting resources behind someone that they wanted to be successful because they they saw enough in what we what we did and they realized if they made a further investment, um, it was really going to impact, you know, the, the sports community um, by, you know, investing in, in black talent um, and then highlighting them so others could could do the same. So we owe a lot to them. It's a great group to be a part of. And I think we'll stay tight with that cohort for, for a long time. But, you know, they were one of the few groups that kind of um, that elevated and supported us because we weren't the norm. Um, instead of, you know, you know, kind of having that glass ceiling. Nice. I want to ask you like an internal question that just came to mind. You, you've helped, you know, hundreds, thousands of people in the U.S. And how does that make you feel to, to you know, be impacting people in such a positive way? Um, you know, I always say to people, like, I just put my name on stuff. You know, I have a large staff and they do a lot of good work. Um, but it is cool. Um, and you feel good knowing that you're having an impact. And now as I'm, you know, going shopping around the city, um, and people stop me and let me know that, you know, that one, they never knew that I've actually played sports, but that, that their kids, you know, have been impacted by our programs and, or they'll tell me stories about the work that my staff is doing that I, that I wasn't aware of. Um, it's reaffirming and reassuring and gratifying to know that you're having an impact. And, you know, we have the data, but there's nothing like, like real life, you know, hearing it and seeing it. So it feels good, you know, and it's a measure of success. And it's kind of like, how, you know, how does it feel in scoring a goal? Like it, it, it's a win and that's why we, we do this. And so um, those moments, you know, keep you going. And it doesn't matter what people say, you know, you know, the mother that said, like, if it wasn't for you, they wouldn't have eaten that week or their kids wouldn't have been able to even get into the sport. Or, you know, I have a mom that brings her child to, you know, 10 soccer clinics a year and takes off of work in summer because that's the only place where her autistic son um, feels comfortable around other kids. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I... I met her when I visited the camp, but I knew nothing about it. It also makes you proud that the staff has evolved so much um, that they're able to work with um, all students and really create an impactful, inclusive environment. It, it, it just makes me so excited to hear that I, I haven't done something to, to your degree of what you're doing, but I can just only imagine and I just, I feel the impact that you're having in regards to just listening to what you're saying. Could you share, you know, you have the data, could you share um, in regards to the numbers of things that you guys were able to achieve in regards to how many players you guys were able to um, um, enable to have ac um, access to sport, um, how many people you were able to, you know, provide food, like those numbers? Well, I, I mean, I'd have to get off, but um, my, uh, get the dashboard out, but, you know, we've had, you know, you know, between four and 8,000 kids a year go to free soccer camp, week-long camp. Um, we will hire, you know, uh, 75 to 150 youth each summer with jobs um, so that they can work at these soccer camps. I know that we, we distribute between two and three million pounds of, of food a year to, you know, 250 individuals um, per year. 
Um, so those are those are some 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 big numbers. You know, we we have 14 young people that live in housing that we support annually. Um, we have social workers on staff. We have over 150,000 visitors that come to our park, and you can see the character of the park and the dome behind us. It gets cold in Minnesota, um, but we provide a safe place for thousands of kids to come and play. So um, we move the needle in a, in a in a large way. Um, but the data itself on paper, um, you know, it, while looking impressive, nothing beats the story from a mother on the impact that, that it's having on her and her family. Um, I'm going to I'm going to cut this out, Tony, but do you and have we trained we trained we trained over, I would say one thing over the last year, uh, we trained over 14,000, you know, youth coaches and parents, you know, in the MLS Youth Academies to help them recognize respond to uh report and resist discriminatory behavior in the in the sports ecosystem so that's a it's a newer program um that's that's working well that we're really proud of nice um i know we're up here on time i want to be respectful do you have an extra five minutes yes okay um Looking ahead, what are your goals and aspirations, both personally and professionally, and con uh, continuing to contribute to the development and well-being of communities through sports? Well, first, I got to get with you and figure out how to get into ownership. So that's one. Um, secondly, you know, I want to make sure that you know what I'm building right now and what my team's building is sustainable, um, so that it's here and it doesn't revolve around me, um, and that we continue to um be fluid and adapt to the needs of the community so that we're here helping people based on their needs and not what we want to do and deliver um and um you know those are really the, the the two main things you know i think we we will continue to look more holistically on how we help people meeting them where we're at and then you know in the back of my mind you know i would i would love to be here when the U.S. wins the World Cup, and and know that I was a part of it, um, and some level, you know, as a player, as a trailblazer, as building a nonprofit, and just see how the rest of the world sees, you know, soccer connecting people, um, but also championing it, um, the best of the best in the world. Nice. You mentioned club ownership. I'm excited to talk to you about that after. Yeah. Um, I have just like two lighthearted, fun questions. How do you feel about Messi in the U.S. and the impact he's having? Um, I mean, kind of like Beckham, anytime you bring an international star here and they actually produce, um, it's having a great, great um, impact. I think, you know, with TV markets drive pro sports. So I think the rest of the world is, is paying more attention to what we do. And he's helped us recruit other world class players here. Um, his performance on the field has been great to see. I mean, we're, we're we're talking about our older player, but we're also talking about the best player for the best team in the world, you know, six months ago at, at the World Cup and where we judge everybody. So um, it's great that that people, that we can watch the best player in the world, you know, in person here live, that we can match up against them and see how we stack up. Um, and although he is, you know, messy, and he's still an all-star and unbelievable. Um, you know, his stats are very similar to what he has in other places. I mean, he is supposed to dominate no matter where he goes. So it's nice to see it here. It's nice to see the excitement of the kids, right? Like in other places, you know, you see Messi jerseys. And that's just fervor into the game because when you watch Messi, you watch who he plays against. And you watch the MLS. And you're watching American soccer. Um, and that's cool, right? That's cool that. The world is watching, um, watching it right here. In the U.S., yeah. And the last one, what are your thoughts on the 2026 World Cup, which is in like two years? Um, well, I mean, I don't know where that goes. There's, there's so much that can happen. Um, you know, I think, um, unfortunately, what happened at the end of the last World Cup with, with our coaching situation, yeah, I think stunted the situation a little bit. But I think... They had a great World Cup in terms of providing building blocks with the talent we had and putting young people at an opportunity to grow and become a team for the next World Cup. Um, 
So we have a good young core that are playing um, for some big clubs in Europe. Um, you know, I think, you know, getting a back four that's a little bit more consistent is, is going to be really important um, in, in building a team. Um, and then somebody's got to take the reign as, as the superstar. Um, so we'll see who that, that becomes. But, you know, it, it's incredible that we get to showcase the sport here. Um, and I would hope that, you know, we make a run into the semifinals and then anything can happen um, on any given day. So I'm just looking for, you know, soccer to bring this country together um, and celebrate the diversity around the world here in the biggest party celebration, collaboration, sporting event um, in the history of everything. Um, and it's going to be here um, and soccer is going to be at the, the head of it. So I'm excited. And I think yeah. it'll do a lot to help. You know, we had we had Messi. We keep having these things that give us these little bumps. And I think you put enough of them together, it'll really help us sustain the situation. There'll be a lot more investment in soccer and the growth of the game and hopefully the sustainability of it as well. Absolutely. Super excited to catch that big wave. Tony, uh, thank you so much for taking the time for joining us on the One Soccer Nation podcast today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to catching up. And, um, you know, I think you said something to me about, um, you know, looking at the impact. All that means is I'm young. I'm old. Right. And like you're you're young and you're already investing in the game and looking at things. So keep doing what, what you're doing. And um, I'm sure you'll you'll pass me when years before you, you get to be 50. So keep up the great work and and pushing the game. And thanks for all you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. Thank you.